it'll be a tough skull to crack. The far western approach is guarded by watchtowers. No easy back way in. Your friends are held in the center. That's also where the Hierophant is keeping his new gods. Then we have the front gate, heavily fortified with siege devourers in front. So how do we get in? Front door. Didn't you just say it's heavily fortified? I also said the siege devourers are out front. A good place for scaring people off. A bad place for actual defense. We grab them first. And how do we know you won't just turn on us? Dead God's Mouse. You do not understand us, do you? I understand enough. You're animals. Savage animals, and I will dance on your graves. Fear rots her heart. Do you blame her? No. She was a prisoner of the Char. Now she is a prisoner of her fears. Until she can conquer them, she is no good to any of us. So the new saga, Ice Brood, is going to be set in a classic Guild Wars 1 location. We haven't been to for how long is it now? I of the North was 2009, so 10 years. It's a bit like Path of Fire came out, replacing Nightfall. It's like a decade later. But a decade later, we are going to some of the Eye of the North locations. That is far north of Ascalon. So what you're currently looking at is Guild Wars 1. This is 250 years before current Tyria. In fact, even more than that now, as time continues marching. And this was during a time where the Flame Legion was still very much in control and were still very much following and mandating a lot of the things that the Char did. So this is kind of the Blood Legion homelands, but we really didn't get much of the Blood Legion here. We have this location known as the Doom Lord Shrine, an outpost nearby overlooking it from the mountains, Long Eyes Ledge, and three explorable maps with some dungeons. That was it in Guild Wars 1, really. But today, I want to, in this video, run through these, go a bit of a nostalgia trip, and talk about some of the epic stuff, including what's this in the center here? That's right, that's Kraukatoric Sleeping body and one thing i haven't really seen much discussion on at all for the internet as we look for our ice brood saga beginning is will we get something on this on where kraukatoric was asleep just last episode and i know we're between two seasons here kraukatoric was just defeated so what a beautiful thing to then have a patch where we immediately go to where he may have woken up obviously 250 years from now a lot of stuff has changed there's a big blood keep supposedly around and i would presume that guild wars 2 is going to give us the space slightly to the north, the space slightly to the south and the side. But a lot of this should be returning stuff. And I, for one, can't wait. So let's run through, see what we think and uh, what we can remember about Guild Wars 1's version of the upcoming saga patch. So I'll be doing some post-commentary here. I've just been playing the game for a little bit over an hour, enjoying myself. Uh, the main outpost to Doomlore Shrine does have this lore. This dark shrine radiates heat and magic, a testament to the ancient days of char domination and worship to their former gods, the Titans. So this is after the Titans were dethroned in prophecies. Now, in the absence of these deities, the shrine has become a haven for the char shaman caste. An entrance at the shrine leads to a sprawling complex beneath, known as the Cathedral of Flames. So dungeons were a big mechanic in Eye of the North, of course. Some of them were featured here in the Blood Legion homelands, and in fact, I would say the most famous of them was this, the Cathedral of Flames, COF as we all called it, and obviously Guild Wars 2 has its own version of COF that's also related to the Char, just in a slightly different area of the world that's been accessible since 2012. So I actually really like the idea of as this saga unfolds, we get to return to these places. So far, the press is revealed when the epilogue comes out and we begin in these maps. We're going to get something to do with the Ooze Pit, which is one of the other dungeons, and we'll have a look at it in a second on this video. But I'm wondering if maybe as the saga goes along, they'll give us fresh access to this place, the Cathedral of Flames, and to some of the other dungeons too. That would be pretty great. So the story on this, as we do a quick run through, I actually beat the whole dungeon just for nostalgia's sake and having fun. And the story here is that the this is actually a human ruin. The humans had actually pushed all the way up here, it seems, in an Ascalonians particularly, I suppose, is the presumption, in their arrogance moving beyond the Great Northern Wall, and eventually the territories were reclaimed however long ago. Uh, but there were some Ascalonian treasures here, 
and they are still being guarded by spirits. The Char recently unearthed the treasure and annoyed the spirits. So we play as an adventuring band watching Char. You see this like giant mess hall. It looks like the Blood Legion are hanging out in the Char as they are also fighting ghosts. So you get kind of this cool feeling where if you look here, a lot of the enemies are distracted because they're, they're fighting one another. It's kind of a big brawl. And I've always liked that sense of this place. Uh, the specific leader of these ghosts is a spirit called Murakai, who has had nothing to do with Guild Wars 2 so far at all. Uh, and I really like the idea in the final quest text for this dungeon. They say, oh, I doubt Murakai will be uh, idle for long. And then they kind of leave it there. Dungeons in Eye of the North were meant to be replayable. So I don't know whether that was just the lore giving themselves an out in case a, a player decided to repeat the dungeon or something. But I certainly think seeing something to do with Murakai after the faux fire was over and stuff would be really fun. In fact, this whole dungeon kind of feels like an early glimpse at the upcoming world shaking events of the faux fire that was, you know, going to happen in the 250 year gap. Because what do we have here? We have maddened Ascalonian ghosts that are pretty indistinct discriminate in their targets and that's kind of what happened with the faux fire later uh, you know it, guild was 2 even drawn an explicit tie between the two stories and the two places could be very fun so yeah i'll show you various highlights of the dungeon uh, the group i'm running this on at the moment is and, it, and this whole video is shot with is an extremely glassy um, mercenary set that I actually did a build video on on my second channel a long time ago now. So it's actually ultra, ultra, ultra aggressive. Like everything should blow up instantly. And if they don't, we kind of die. But it's good enough for a lot of normal mode content, which is what I'm doing here. I had a real blast remembering like this bone pit at the bottom of the second floor. As we go through into the third floor. Who remembers this iconic room? A mysterious hall filled with burning trees deep in a sprawling complex underground and the idea is that this is you know this is like hellfire or whatever it's necrofire i guess there wasn't any real law talking about that that was that was just my presumption given the idea is that we're in some kind of haunted area you've got all this magic and the enchanted bows around if you guys don't know how dungeons were organized in eye of the north arena net was pretty crunched with their implementation so a lot of the dungeons borrow assets from one another in a very sad way that was something guild wars 2 did much better every dungeon had a completely unique environment but this is an example of a room that you didn't see anywhere else as far as remember but this, if you want to see these burning trees, you had to come into the original Guild Wars 1 COF. You used to lag my frame super hard as well, but nowadays, you can render it beautifully. This was a three-floor dungeon, so to get the boss key, you had to put the dungeon key in the lock on the third door, and Murakai Steward would appear as a mini-boss. I actually think this mini-boss is harder than the boss itself. So if you look at my mini-map, you'll see this room is full of graves, that if you walk near any of them, you get swarmed. I forgot about that mechanic recording this with you guys. So I charge in and we get completely dominated by loads of spirits. Uh, there's poison traps in the room as well, which are really difficult and will continue pressuring you. So uh, luckily we have crazy res potential here. But the idea is you've got to get up, spike the boss down, and try not to move as much as possible. Here you see I've got to collect the key over there. This is something you don't really experience in Guild Wars 2. Because you just vacuum loot into your inventory. And there's no equivalent mechanics. But here we got to get the key. But the key itself is a quest. Because as we move forward. We keep spawning more mobs. And doing more dangerous things. Luckily I can spam fall back to get through. You got these last chambers here. With all the fire traps. You get to put the key in the lock. And you have one big lavery room. So it's kind of interesting in that it's kind of a flame legion-y, kind of char -y kind of story. But about ghostly Ascalonians. And there's all this lava and stuff down here as well. I'd love to return here. Not that I think they're going to do a big Primordis story at any point during the Ice Brood Saga. And I can't see how it would tie into the big plots. But it might be kind of a fun diversion. Some of you guys will be thinking, oh... If they're going to revisit these places in Guild Wars 2, surely they're going to do it as dungeons. I really don't think that you should think of them, even though they have the same name, I really don't think you should think of them as equivalent features or mechanics. We could go into an enormous Guild Wars 2 dungeon debate if you like. But uh, largely, I think they'll treat, if we get to return to places like this, a bit like they seem to be with the Use Pit. There'll be places you can travel to as functions of open world maps, more likely than anything else. And maybe we'll see something go on with strike missions. Maybe we'll see some part of the actual story deal with it. As for fighting Murakai, after she summons all of her friends to deal with us, uh, we just drain her energy in this composition. So all she can do is auto attack and occasionally try to cast a spell that my uh, team is just going to instantly interrupt. So you're not really going to see her mechanics. But this was a particularly interesting dungeon because of farming it. 
Um, people could solo it, you could speed clear it in various ways, and it had a certain type of loot dropping called Golden Rin Relics that you could trade in for very special headpieces. Like, I think the Mask of the Mozing I'm wearing right now was only from getting very rare loot as you rolled through. Amazingly, while recording this footage for you guys, just here today, I got a Golden Rin Relic drop, and you won't believe how excited I was at that revelation. Even though it doesn't mean anything to me anymore, I have all the skins and stuff, I'm still conditioned to enjoy that kind of thing. So anyway, that's one of the dungeons. There are, of course, uh, a couple more. You've got the Ooze Pit, you've got Ragar's Menagerie, you've got the uh, Citadel of Cathandrax, I think it was called. But I won't be showing those here. I want to get to the overworld and give you guys a glimpse of this beautiful environment that we'll be going to. If you do want to see all the dungeons, I have a full series on all of this. Uh, just check out the playlist on my main channel. So here's the dialogue, of course. It's only a matter of time before Murakai returns. But for the brief moment, the spirits seem peaceable. With these relics, perhaps we can bribe our way out of the camp next time you aren't around to rescue us. So the idea that we went in and we helped out these uh, chart here with the big threat. Speaking of the other dungeons, this quest veiled threat here is what leads you to Ragars. I really like this. So Pyre tells me we're to be allies, human. If that's so, I would warn you of a chart named Ragar Maneater. Deep within his menagerie, he rears a new breed of creatures he intends to utilize to destroy humans and then plans to gain position within the rank of the Char Legions. Thankfully, his plan has not yet come to fruition. The time to strike is now. Before he completes his army of flesh reavers, venture into his menagerie and put an end to his operation and his life. Be sure to defeat his creations as well. Even without his influence, they're savage and dangerous beasts. So this was a really nice dungeon. Actually, one of the ones that I ran a bit more rarely, but what I'm particularly interested in right now is the law and when we look forward to Ice Brood. You guys may be aware of Flesh Reavers as Guild Wars 2 players. They often linger in caves and dangerous areas. Often, as far as the game's mechanics, they're not actually that threatening. But what's cool about Thresh Re Flesh Reavers is they didn't actually exist in Guild Wars 1 until Eye of the North. And it was in this dungeon they really talked about it. Flesh Reavers are like undead guys, but they're still alive. They're still living creatures. They're like molded together of bone and, you know, sinew and they're gory creations cobbled together, still alive and potentially suffering or whatever. And we kind of hear of Ragar, this char, this necromancer char, I think he was, in, in his dungeon that was working a lot and creating things. So I'd like to see maybe in Ice Breed, we deal a little bit more with the Flesh Reavers, which are now very abundant over the next 250 years. They kept growing and growing. Anyway, check it out. So in one of the maps that we have this beautiful open field. Look at this big sense of scale and scope. I hope that Guild Wars 2 is able to recapture this. Looking at all of the Eye of the North Guild Wars 1 locations puts me into a really nostalgic space where it's not just nostalgia that I feel. It's actually excitement. When, when Eye of the North was going on, it was all, wow, this is how good the game looks. Uh, imagine how good it's, it's going to look when Guild Wars 2 comes around. Imagine how incredible this will feel in the new engine or the new interpretation. And it's funny because now in Guild Wars with the mounts and the incre incredible movement speed and the waypointing around everywhere, I don't feel as uh, impressed and immersed and uh, sunken into an, an enormous environment as some of these either north places make me feel. Like, look at these big rolling fields. I don't feel this way when I'm in Kessex. I don't feel this way when I'm in Queensdale. I wonder if in Ice Brood... When we return to this place, I will have this same sensation. But anyway, this was a beautiful moment. A Siege Devourer, of course. These were big things here in this uh, area of the world. This is a super dangerous, massive Siege Devourer boss. You'll see that just turned around and dunked my whole party. We do manage to get the rest just because I have, uh, you know, uh, so many We Shall Returns in the composition and so on. Uh, but we could kill him. Another thing you could do in these maps is just kill regular Siege Devourers. This one is not a boss, so we just blow it up straight away. And you could mount it. So people think of mounting as being something that came to the franchise with Path of Fire. That's not correct, really. Guild Wars 1 had a mount mechanic. You literally just saw, we cast a skill called Mount. Our skill bar has changed. We are now in a Siege Devourer. And we get to ride around in it. We know that in Ice Brood, at the very start anyway, we're going to have dune buggies and stuff. But do you think the devs will look into Siege Devourers by the end of the whole saga? That would be pretty nice. It would be a nice callback to what was such a fun mechanic running around in this specific region of the world. You can do this everywhere in Eye of the North, but you could do it in the Char homelands. What's especially fun about this mechanic, actually, is as you load through map portals, usually in Guild Wars 1, it would strip all your consumables and buffs and stuff off of you. But you could just run around on a Siege Devourer going through maps and everything, and it would be fine. Here's the big moment uh, that I alluded to at the start of the video. Yes, it is true. You could see Kraukatorik himself in Guild Wars 1. There was no lore or deeper hint about him 
just this thing on the mountains. As Guild Wars 2 was coming out, the movement of the world lore article was shown, concept art of Krakatoric was shown. We started to know much, much more clearly, okay, this is an Elder Dragon. But as far as Eye of the North was initially concerned, it was just that mountain in the background there. It looked so vast and incredible that that could be a creature back in the day. Now I look at it as a Guild Wars 2 player in 2019 that has defeated that Elder Dragon and seen how much more enormous they actually ended up making it in Guild Wars 2. If you play Dragonfall, really look at the size of Krakatoric there compared to that piddly little thing we just saw a second ago in this video. It's astounding. And in Guild Wars 2, they managed to have him animated. He, his tail moves and if you're standing on him, it will fling you in the air. You can actually see him struggling. The meta event will crystallize his entire shell like it's a dynamic real thing in guild wars 2 even when he's crashed into the ground in dragonfall but that's how he originally looked in eye of the north moving through we get another little bit of a look you know we see some scale around there are some interesting things that we fight here. It's not just Char. Uh, we're going to see Mandragore in a second. We're going to see Mantids. Both are categories of creature that Guild Wars 2 hasn't really done yet. So I wonder what Arena Net will do there. But yeah, so we go into the Sacknoth Valley. So this was actually kind of a difficult remote area of the world. Because there is no outpost directly linked to it. You have to think about... Imagine if there was a Guild Wars 2 open world map that had no waypoints in it whatsoever. The only way to get there is to go through another open world map. And you kind of have the feel for what Sack North Valley is. So it felt very remote. This here is where the Eye of the North campaign for the Char stuff actually ends. We assault this stronghold. The cutscene you watched at the start of this video uh, actually takes place here. You get to enjoy that. So we see lots of Grawl here as well. I'd like to see these in Ice Broods. They're actually quite dangerous as well. Get lots of Hammernox. I realize that... A big part of my composition is keeping hexes up on one specific target and draining and procking Mindrack. So I decided to leave my Siege Devourer here. I decided to go for the dismounts. But one of my favorite things in all of the Char homelands is a burning forest that we're about to see. Now, this is actually outside one of the other dungeons, uh, the Cathedral of Cathandrax. But there was a quest in Guild Wars 1. In Prophecies, which had been years before, we had dealt with the Titan threat and the Char following the Titans. In Eye of the North, they they point out in a side quest that there is one Titan left. Just one. And we knew from the Prophecies campaign that Titans were responsible for mass destruction. But look at this forest. There's a side quest that suggests one Titan survived. And just from existing in this area of the world, this is what it was able to do. There's kind of a suggestion some other fiery things are at play, certainly. But all these fire elementals and gin and things that are drawn to the power and the fire of the era. One Titan, guys. One Titan. And it's because Eye of the North was so much better at presenting big, epic, well-rendered landscapes. Again, this burning forest used to kill frame rates in the day. Now it just looks awesome. And I seriously don't think, after all this time in Guild Wars 2... I've actually had this sensation. Watch as I walk through this burning forest a little more in a second. And we just see trees as far as our eye can see. And this kind of fog descending upon us. And the idea of the smoke. It was really cool in Guild Wars 1 as well. Because of all the enemies that are around here. You could easily over aggro. And they're all really deadly. They're super deadly fire elementalists. And you feel ultra threatened. We're not in any particular content. We might just be moving to a dungeon or something right now. But this was a scary place. Even if you weren't doing quests. And it looks cool even to this day. I loved for the longest time uh, the idea of Guild Wars 2 dealing with Titans as subject material. I actually think that would be a great story to pair with the Wizard's Tower. Maybe we can do a different video on it at some point about that. But, uh, and I'm not sure whether Ice Breed is really the time or place. But we are going to get to come back to this forest. And I wonder, I wonder what this is like in 250 years. Presumably not still burning and so on, right? But are there going to be any signs, any suggestions about the Titan that roamed here? The one Titan and the destruction that it wrought? Fantastic. So that's the Sacknoth Valley. The last map to see is the Grothmore War, War Downs. We can actually get to there from the initial outpost. This is Long Eyes Ledge. This is in the Shiver Peaks looking out over. So I don't know if we'll get Long Eyes Ledge exactly where you see me standing right now in the prologue. I think that that might be on episode 1 and 2 when we seem to go into the Shiver Peaks. But Long Eye's Ledge, this steep sloping hillside overlooking Green Char Lands is the home of Old Fun Long Eye. The ledge overlooks a passage for both Char and human raiding parties alike. And many travellers use this hearthstead as a stopping point during long journeys. Old Fun has made it clear to all, any fighting is prohibited. So what's cool about that place is, you know, the Char and the humans are fighting one another so much. And the Norn don't really care about the conflict. But the Norn are badasses, okay? The level to which the Norn feel like badasses in Eye of the North is incredible, guys. And what the devs are essentially saying there 
is Char and humans are forced to stop fighting because this Norn will just say, no, you don't get to do that. And he's so brutal and so intimidating and so badass, he can kind of just put a stop to it. He can be an arbitrator. What a beautiful idea. I love the Norn, and I can't wait to see them do more of that fiery sprood, please. But maybe that's not really for episode one and the prologue. Maybe that's a bit further down the line. As for the rest, I actually think one of the Twitter teasers and one of the trailers I've already done a video on uh, kind of shows this waterfall on my right. The waterfall, the waterfall feels so big here, though, and the rapids feel so fast and intimidating. Obviously, this is a game where we can't jump or swim or anything, so we feel a lot more powerless when looking around the environment. But look at the huge forests. Don't forget that there was a, an update to Guild Wars 1. Here you're going to see these stalkers blow me up. There was an update to Guild Wars 1 improving the view distance and stuff recently. And this map is definitely one that really benefited from that because you get so much more of the scope. There used to be fog kind of pulling it in a lot more. And now we can appreciate just so much else. You run along the south of the map, you can find the Ooze Pit, which is the last dungeon. And this is it. This is really what it was in Guild Wars 1. This is the kind of content we had here. This is some of the stuff I'm excited to see, where Krakatorik's body was and so on. And in just a few days, we'll be able to visit this place 250 years or more into the future. I guess we'll see how it goes. Thanks very much for watching, guys. And again, I have playlists on lots more of this from Guild Wars 1 if you check out my channel. Until next time, take it easy. I think the devs just did another really good interview. I'm very keen to show you.